everyone. Um, welcome to KubeCon Valencia. Um, we're here to talk about cloud native storage and the CNCF uh, storage tag. Um, we're recording this, and there are going to be some virtual uh, questions potentially as well. And Lisa Marine Alfie over here is moderating the, uh, the discussion. So, a little bit of introductions. My name is uh, Alex Kirchhoff. Um, I'm the co-chair of the CNCF storage tag, um, and this is my co-presenter. Raffaele Spazzoli. I, I work for Red Hat as an architect, uh, OpenShift architect in consulting. Um, we also had uh, Jing Yang, who was supposed to join us, but um, unfortunately, she couldn't travel at the last, at the last moment. But we do have um, a little video clip from her later on, so that's cool. Um, so we're going to talk about a few things today. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, a little overview of the tag and maybe if you're interested how you can join and, and, and help with the community. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, cloud native storage and you know, what it is and why it's important. And then we're going to cover some of the um, documents and materials that we've been working on in the tag, like our landscape documents, the performance and benchmarking, um, and also the disaster recovery. Um, and finally, we're going to finish off with a, a little view of some of the projects which are in the CNCF landscape for um, storage. So by way of introduction, the CNCF TAG storage, um, TAG is the technical advisory group, a couple of, was created um, a couple of years back um, and originally was called the SIG, um, but then we realized that there was too much confusion between Kubernetes SIGs and CNCF SIGs, so we renamed the CNCF SIG to TAGs. Um, we're, we're, we meet uh, every two weeks um, or twice a month uh, on the, at 8 a.m. Pacific, so 5 p.m. Uh, European, um, and we, uh, we have all of our calls online and everything is, is public, so please feel free to join. Um, the tag is a group of uh, diverse people. We have individual contributors. We have um, uh, uh, representatives from different storage vendors, but fundamentally, they're all uh, expert, have pr provide expertise in our storage space. Um, we have a number of coaches, tech leads, and we liaise with TOC, which is the Technical uh, Operations Committee. Um, one of the things um, that the tag is designed to do is effectively to help scale the CNCF. So, so as the CNCF keeps on scaling with hundreds of uh, members and, and end user organizations, we work with the TOC to, um, to help review projects and provide expertise in our particular area. And we help review and uh, do, do the due diligence on uh, storage projects that are going through incubation or graduation within the, CN within the CNCF. And, and finally, we also prepare um, content to help end users understand cloud native storage and what cloud native storage does uh, in the environment. So I'm just going to touch on a couple of minutes um, on why cloud native storage is important. I guess you're all here because you know a little bit about it. But I'll go out and say this. There is no such thing as a stateless architecture. All applications everywhere store state somewhere, whether it's a database, a file, a key value store, an object store, um, uh, or a file system. So this is an integral part of, of each part of the environment. And, and whilst um, in some of the cloud native spaces, Stateless was the focus for a number of years. Stateful applications are a thing, and all the database providers, all the key value stores, all the object stores, etc., cetera, um, uh, provide a plethora of, of uh, solutions for this. So a little bit about what cloud native storage is. Um, a few of the key things are that it's declarative and composable. So in much the same way that developers should be able to define CPU, memory, networking, um, load balancers, et cetera, in, in for their environment and for their application. They should also be able to define the requirements that they need from storage and the data services for high availability and disaster recovery. And we'll touch on a little bit of that later. The other key important thing is that cloud-native storage is application-centric. And, and what do I mean by that? Today, um, a lot of storage solutions are server-centric, and we think of, of storage in a, in a very server or operating system way, where, say, volumes are 
presented to a particular server or databases are installed on a, on a, on a specific server. But what, we, what we're looking at with cloud native storage is, is the portability of the storage environment and the, and the data services therein, right? So whether you're accessing storage by um, an API or whether you're accessing it uh, like a, with a database or whether you're accessing storage volumes, for example, you want the storage to be portable and move with the application and, and as, as your application uh, scales and fails overs and, and, and gets automated by things like Kubernetes. Um, and, I'll, and I'll touch on this last point here as well, which is, it's a bit cliche, and some people will roll their eyes, but, but I also think that cloud-native storage should be agile, and, and what do I mean by that? In cloud-native environments, you have lots of moving parts. Um, nodes come and go, we get, get rebuilt, um, clusters scale up and scale down on the band, and, and really you, we need to think about how they perform and, and how security and, and how availability is, is made in that uh, ever-changing uh, environment. So, um, in the uh, in the cloud native um, in the in the CNCF storage tag, one of the things we did to help uh, end users work is we created a storage white paper which describes some of the attributes um, that we would like to look at in terms of um, in terms of cloud native storage. This was supposed to be presented by Jing, so I'm going to play a quick five-minute video um, of, uh, of, of the presentation here. This is the audio. Uh, there's no audio from the video. Storage systems have several storage attributes, availability, scalability, performance, consistency, and durability. Availability defines the ability to access the data during failure conditions. Scalability can be measured by the ability to scale the number of clients, throughput or number of operations, the capacity, and the number of components. Performance can be measured against latency, the number of operations per second, and the throughput. Consistency refers to the ability to access newly created data or updates after it has been committed. A system can either be eventually consistent or strongly consistent. Durability is affected by the data production layers, levels of redundancy, the endurance of the storage media and ability to detect corruption and recover the data. There are several storage layers that can impact the storage attributes. For example, rather than directly access resources, a hypervisor can provide access to resources which could add access overhead. Storage topology describes the arrangement of storage kind of compute resources and the data link between them this includes centralized, distributed, sharded, and hyper-converged topologies. Storage systems usually have data production layer, which adds redundancy. This refers to RAID, erasure coding, and replicas. Storage systems usually provide data services in addition to the core storage functions, including replication, snapshots, clones, and so on. So the system ultimately places data on physical storage layer, which is usually non-volatile. It has impact on the overall performance and the long-term durability. In this diagram, we can see that workloads consume storage through different data access interfaces. There are two categories of data access interfaces here. We call them volumes and API. Container orchestration system has interfaces for volumes, which supports both block and file systems. Under API, we have object store API that stores for that stores or retrieves objects. Note that there is a Kubernetes six storage subproject called Cozy container object storage interface, which introduces Kubernetes APIs to support 
orchestration of object store operations for Kubernetes workloads. It also introduces Cozy as a set of gRPC interfaces so that a object store defender can write a driver for provisioning, accessing object stores. This is targeting alpha in Kubernetes 1.25 release. On the API, we also have key value stores and databases. Now let's take a look of the orchestration and management interfaces. The control plane interfaces here refers to storage interface directly supported by the seals. This includes container storage interface, CSI, and the Docker volume driver interface. This orange box here is an extension of control plane interfaces. For application API, including uh, key value store and databases, CEOs currently don't have direct interfaces for it yet, but we could have operators to support key value stores or databases to work in Kubernetes. That's all I have for the storage landscape white paper. Now I will hand it over to Alex to talk about the performance white paper. Thank you, Ying, virtually. Um, so we'll move on. So after we, after we put together the, the storage uh, white paper, which, which effectively covers the attributes and the different layers of the storage system and how they interact with each other, which is, which is so important to, to, to understand nowadays because so many of the systems that we use um, are formed of composite layers. So for example, you have file systems made up of object stores and databases built on key value stores, etc., and therefore they inherit attributes around the way they scale and the way they're, they're, they perform um, based on those different layers. And we, we then took the next step and said, what are we going to do after the storage white paper? And we, and we decided to pick on two attributes, the performance and disaster and, and recovery and availability to, to do a bit more of a deep dive into um, how we can, how we can uh, get to the bottom of some of these things. So we put together um, a white paper on performance and what we're looking um, to, to build in here, and we, we're still open to, to drafts, by the way, so anybody who's, who's open to contributing is very welcome. Um, we're covering a number of different concepts. So we, we're looking at how to benchmark um, databases primarily and volumes as, as two of the first main things. And what we're looking to, to, and what we're covering is the, the basics. So for example, what do we want to look at in terms of either operations or throughput? Because sometimes it's more important to measure the, the number of operations per second. For example, if you're, if you're talking about databases and transactions, um, and sometimes it's much more important to have, say, sequential throughput capabilities for um, things like analytics, for maybe something like Elasticsearch. Um, and, and, and those sort of systems can, can have you know, very different compromises uh, in, terms of, in terms of how they're put together. And then trying to understand and measure how things like the topology, the data protection, um, the data reduction and encryption affects the overall performance of the system, both in terms of you know, adding additional latency or, or, or uh, affecting throughput, but also in terms of um, the, the additional um, the additional levels of complexity or the additional um, um, topology differences that you see, say, between hyperconverged or disaggregated systems or, or remote systems, for example. Um, in, in many of the discussions, latency tends to be um, a really big factor in, in determining a lot of these things. So we'll see compromises on um, or, or, or you know, different pros and cons between different systems, between the data protection and things like encryption and also the topology. And, that, and the way that affects latency tends to directly affect things like you know, transactions per second in an environment. So, so often latency is one of those key things, but also concurrency. So one of the, one of the things we, we, we want to um, measure is how uh, applications scale in these environments and, and often concurrency is one, of those, is one of those key factors there where we, we're talking about you know, how many um, clients can connect in parallel, how many parallel threads and how many parallel queues can, can, can operate. And of course, in all of these systems, 
caching happens at multiple layers, you know, at the operating system layer, at volume manager layers, at the file system layers, at page caches, device layers. So <clears throat> it, um, it's, important, it's important to really understand what you're measuring and, what, and how much of an impact the cache is having to those environments to actually get uh, a real understanding of the, of the system. And of course, we also want to set a level playing field, right? So um, understanding how to manage the environment where you're doing performance testing or, or, or benchmarking um, and making sure that you have the right headroom in both the, 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 the environment, whether it's you know, bare metal or, or cloud, um, and the headroom that the client needs to actually maximize the, the performance testing. Um, one of the key takeaways, though, is that it's really important to, um, to focus on testing your, your own applications in your own environments. It's really, really hard to compare published results without a deep understanding of the test conditions. And in fact, so, many, so, so, so much of the paper is actually dedicated to, to the pitfalls and the common issues that, that uh, people encounter when, when doing performance benchmarking. Um, I can't tell you how many uh, benchmarks I've seen where um, somebody has published, for example, oh, I just got two gigabytes per second on my file system, and then you ask them what they're running on, and they're running on a, uh, a hard drive that can only give you 200 megabytes per second, so they were really only testing the speed of their cache rather than the speed of their file system, for example. So, so those, those, those are the things that, that we need to, to look at. Um, the next thing that we covered was disaster recovery, which um, Rafael is going, to, is going to take us through. Thank you, Alex. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, in this, uh, in the Cloud Native Disaster Recovery white paper, we examine a question, which is how should disaster recovery look like in the cloud? And we submit an approach to you. We, we propose an idea, which uh, surprise we call Cloud Native Disaster Recovery. And um, it's, um, it's an approach that you should know about. We don't say, we don't think you should always use it. But I think it's good to know that this exists and it's an option and we have done some studies around it. Now to compare and contrast uh, cloud native disaster recovery, this approach that we, that we describe here in the white paper with uh, traditional disaster recovery, we, let's, let's use this table uh, and, and look at the main differences. Um, so first of all, the deployment, the architecture that we, we see normally in big organizations, in large organizations for traditional disaster recovery is active-passive, meaning we have a, an active data center or an active cloud region, and when something goes wrong, every, the workload is moved somehow to, to a passive uh, location. In cloud-native disaster recovery, we want to do active-active deployments. Uh, the trigger for the... Um, the detection and the trigger for the disaster, so the decision that we are experiencing a disaster situation and we have to start moving the workload or reacting to it. Uh, in, in traditional disaster recovery, it's typically a human-based decision. Uh, something goes wrong, all the alerts fire, people meet, and then they decide, okay, we cannot recover, we need to trigger the disaster recovery procedure. In cloud-native disaster recovery, we want autonomous decisions made by the system. So aut autonomous decision and then also, as we see in the next line, automated response to, to the disaster. Uh, yeah, the procedure itself, normally what we see in, in large organization is a mix of automated and manual tasks. The better the organization is, the more automation there is, but you know, the, the, the trigger, like we, say, is all, like we said, is often human and then uh, human uh, <coughs> A human, uh, this, a, human, uh, um, a task, and then there are some other things that typically are done manually. In, in cloud native, again, we want uh, a fully automated recovery procedure. And then with re regards to the two main metrics that you can use to measure how well you're doing disaster recovery, the recovery time objective, which is how long does it take before you're up and, uh, up and running again, and the recovery point objective, which is how uh, many transactions you have lost because of the outage um, when you recover. Uh, in, in traditional DR for the RTO, 
we usually are from zero if, you, if it's very good organization to more likely ours. In, in cloud native DR, <laughs> oops, <laughs> wow, <laughs> this is a disaster. Yeah. In cloud native DR, we are close to zero, and it's really seconds. Uh, it's the time for the LCHECs to react and understand that there is a disaster and, then for, and for the global balancer to swing the traffic. And for the RPO, it's again zero to hours depending on what, uh, uh, what approach I use to, uh, to persist data. Um, but in, in cloud native disaster recovery, it's exactly zero. So I never lose data if I'm using a strongly consistent, consistent approach. And it's theoretically unbounded, but um, for you know, practical deployment, uh, close to zero if I'm using uh, eventual consistent deployment. And then looking at more at the organizational side, the uh, owner of the disaster recovery procedure in traditional DR, it's actually the storage team. It, formally, the application teams have to build their own business continuity document or process but what they usually do is they turn around to the storage team and they ask what is your you know disaster recovery procedure what are your SLA and then they adopt whatever the storage team is doing in that organization so it's really the storage team is driving the disaster recovery for the entire uh, company but in cloud native DR it's the, the, applica the application teams are the owner of the disaster recovery procedure um, and b because the DR is really a responsibility of the middleware in, in cloud native DR. Uh, so it's going to be a responsibility of the database, of the, of the queue system, of the cache. And so those are the middleware are now owned by, middleware products are now owned by the application team. And then in terms of capability, this is a finding that we did, that we <coughs> discovered by actually implementing these architectures. Uh, in, in terms of capability, for traditional DR, we usually rely on storage capabilities uh, in order to implement these architectures and, and the disaster recovery procedures. So we use things like backup, restore, or volume replication, synchronous or asynchronous. But in cloud native DR, what we really need are capabilities from networking more than storage. We need an ability to communicate east-west between uh, our regions because remember, they are active-active, so traffic is flowing uh, and going to all of the locations. And we need a, a good global load balancer, something that <clears throat> not only spreads the traffic, but it also has some intelligence to understand which locations are active and can swing the traffic automatically when, when there is a problem. Okay. Um, so in the white paper, what, what you can find is um, <clears throat> this definition that I just gave you. Uh, then some other um, technical, more technical definition about what a failure domain is, what HA and DR is. Um, we covered the CAP theorem a little bit, and then, of course, you're, if you're interested, you should go and read about it much, uh, much more in depth. But all this new generation of middleware that can be deployed the way I described um, is really built around the, the concepts of the CAP theorem. So it's something that we should know. And then we... we talk about the anatomy of a dis distributed uh, stateful workload uh, with shards replica, and I'm going to show a little bit about that. And then we talk about the consensus protocols that are needed to coordinate all of the instances, uh, because obviously we have a multi-instance deployments for these stateful workloads. And then we look at um, <clears throat> some reference implementations or reference architectures for both strong consistency deployment and eventual consistent consistency deployments. So I'm going to pick some of these things just to sh give you a little bit of um, overview of what you can find in, in, the, in, in this white paper. And I find this one interesting. This is the anatomy of a stateful application. So if you abstract uh, this stateful middleware enough, you will find that they're, they all look the same, whether it's a cache, whether it's a queue system, whether it's a database uh, or NoSQL database. They always have uh, a similar structure. They have uh, replicas, so that's, that's how they achieve availability. And then they have partitions, which is what they use to achieve scalability, right? And then uh, in each instance, they have layers 
conce at least conceptual layers. They have a storage layer, they have a code, which is the thing that communicates with the disk, with the actual volumes. And then they have a coordination layer, which is what helps coordinating with, with the rest of the instances. And then they have an API layer, which really defines the identity of the, of the type of workload. So they have a queue system as a different API than a SQL system, uh, than a NoSQL system. And then um, we have, uh, in the coordination layer, we can identify two kinds of coordination. There is an, an inter-replica coordination to make sure that every replica is doing the same thing and they're always aligned on the same uh, st state, they, they have the same view of, of the state. And then we have an inter-partition coordination, which is needed when this software supports inter-partition transactions. So it's when, uh, <coughs> for example, um, if you need to uh, put two messages in, in Kafka uh, in different partition with a single transaction, there will be a, an interpartition transaction. Um, so then what we did is try to take some of these new generation middleware and analyze them in terms of, of the uh, coordination protocols that they use. And what we, find, what we found out is that Raft and Paxos obviously has, are the two most common consensus protocol for the replica coordinations. Uh, Raft now being the preferred one because it's easy to, to implement. And on the <coughs> shared consensus protocol or partition consensus protocol, the two-phase commit or derivations of the two-phase commit is actually what's being used. Um, and then I'm going to close with a little overview of the um, uh, reference architecture for a deployment of these uh, kind of uh, workloads on uh, Kubernetes. So you can see we have three here. This is a strong, consistent um, deployment. So we, we need three uh, failure domain at least. This is because of the CAP theorem. Um, and uh, so we have the stateful workload that is deployed in each of these failure domain. You, from the, the yellow arrows uh, indicate the fact that they need to be able to talk to each other even across failure domain. That's, that's the east-to-west network capability that I was mentioning before. So if you're in Kubernetes, you need a way to have inter-cluster communication. Um, and there are you know, several ways to do it. And then we have probably have a front end in front of our database or stateful workload. And then we have uh, a global load balancer that is supposed to do some health checking and decides to swing the traffic. Um, the, other thing, the other picture here is another analysis that we do, you, because you should not just analyze what happens when you lose an entire region, but also what happens when uh, a region is network partitioned, but it's still available and it's, it's communicating, still communicating with the external clients. It's still able to communicate with the global load balancer. In this case, with strongly consistent um, uh, workloads, because the, um, you know, the, the instances that are partitioned don't have the strict majority, so they, they cannot uh, create quorum, they will put themselves offline and the global balancer will be able to see that uh, that, that uh, location is, is not available and will, will swing the traffic to the available location. So even in this situation, you will get um, those RPO and RTO that we were discussing before, so um, close to seconds of, uh, of a lack of availability and zero, um, and zero data loss. And with that, I'm gonna give it back to Alex, or Singh, actually, I think. Yeah. So, um, so thanks, thanks for asking. So, so we covered okay. off the, the white paper, the performance, and the disaster recovery. Um, one of the. Okay. Is this on? Do you want? Okay, great. So, so we talked about we talked about the, the 
disaster recovery. So thank you, Raphael. We talked about uh, performance and the white paper. Um, one of the common things that we get asked in the tag is, is how do we work with the TOC in terms of um, the, the projects that get approved into, into the TOC and the, to join the foundation. Um, so Zhang is going to talk a little bit about that now, and hopefully I can get this to play. Here we go. CMCF projects have three stages. Sandbox is the earliest stage, meaning the project is still experimental. Donating to CNCF will help build a stronger community around the project. Incubation is the second stage. It means the project has been used successfully in production and has a healthy number of committers. Moving from sandbox to incubation is supposed to be difficult. It needs to go through the due diligence review. And graduation is the highest stage. It means the project has mainstream production use, past security audits, and has committers from multiple organizations. I'm going to talk about graduated and incubating CNCF storage projects. Rook is a graduated project. It is a cloud native storage orchestrator for Kubernetes. It has stable support for SAF and Alpha support for NFS. Vitas is a graduate project. It is horizontally scaling of MySQL. ETCD is a graduated project. It's a distributed key value store. All Kubernetes clusters use ETCD as the primary data store. And TagKV is a graduated project. TagKV is a distributed key value database built in Rust. Harbor is a graduated project. It's a cloud native registry project. Dragonfly is an incubating project. It's a P2P based cloud native image and file distribution system. Langhorn just became an incubating project. It's a distributed block storage system for Kubernetes. And finally, we have a KubeFS, previously TrueBFS, that's newly incubated. It's a distributed file system and object store for cloud native apps. So here shows a list of all the storage projects in CNCF. There are a few more sandbox projects shown here. That's all we have for CNCF projects. Awesome, thank you, Jing. Um, and I just wanted to sort of cover off some of this process because we sometimes get questions from maintainers on this where the, we wanted to just clarify that the sandbox project tends to have a low bar to entry and those projects are there for specifically there to help build the community. The incubation projects have um, uh, the, the most due diligence performed on them and those, those projects are there to um, that are there once they have production users and they have a number of maintainers within the within the environment, um, and graduated um, uh, projects then is the is the final step where they go through um, a process to um, perform security audits and, and, and additional checks um, and have uh, um, final governance uh, and and and. Uh, uh, and distributed maintainers to, to, to ensure the longevity of the project. Okay. So with that, um, I'll be ending the talk, but before we end, I just wanted to again invite everybody to join the community and join our tags. Um, we'd love to hear from you if you have, uh, if you're able to contribute um, to, to any of the white papers that we're building or help us with um, the due diligence processes um, that we're working on in, in projects. And of course, happy to take questions from anybody. Uh, this is more to do with uh, the automated DR parts so of the rec uh, recovery process that you showed us. But um, a lot of the workloads that are being run on Kubernetes are now databases. And in that case, j just a CSI snapshot wouldn't guarantee a consistent backup of the database itself. This specific database tooling needed to get that sort of an automated RPO going. Do you feel there's some synergies there that could happen between databases and st basic uh, storage projects? Hi. Hello. 
Oh yeah, we'll use the mic. Yeah, in um, we use an extended definition of storage. So for us, also databases, queue, queue system, and and cache caches are storage, not just file file system and object storage and, and uh, block storage. So. Yes, to build those architectures, you need um, stateful middleware that you can deploy that way. So I call it this new generation of, of stateful middleware that was built around uh, the CAP theorem. Uh, so not monolithic, but in inherently distributed middleware. And, and, and when you do that, as I was trying to show with the picture, let me see, let me see if I can, yeah, um, you see, the synchronization happens at the stateful middleware layer, not at the storage layer. So, th so these, these disks here, these volumes, are completely unaware of each other. You don't need to take backup or volume snapshot and restore. All the synchronization happens at the, at the transaction level and, and uh, stateful workload level. So the key is choosing something, a product that can actually do that. And, and just on that point, it's, 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 it's how all of the different layers work together, right? It's, it's not about, um, like we discussed in the white paper, you get certain attributes of um, availability or scalability through those different layers, and, and they need to integrate well. There was also one question online that I will mention, but it was, is the talk going to be recorded? And the answer is yes, of course, all the talks are recorded and they are posted very quickly. So who, the person online, that is the answer to that question. Hi, everybody. Hi, guys. Thanks a lot. Great presentation. I was wondering, there's a lot of movement for use cases that they need to achieve low latency and we move the workloads to the edge. Are you considering these sort of edge setups into your analysis and white papers? Your microphone hasn't magically started working yet, Alex. Okay, I'm not gonna need to go for a run today. So, so the question was um, low latency in, in Kubernetes environments. Um, I think what we're seeing is, um, and certainly what, 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 I'm, what I'm seeing with, with sort of both the community that we work with and, and customers that I work with is that um, the latency comes down to two factors primarily, which is the physical media and, and the overall latency through, through a storage stack, but also the networking, right? So some of the, some of the, um, uh, some of the discussions that we were having earlier around the different attributes and, and where you make compromises um, are exactly the sort of things that, that affect latency. So for example, um, if you employ um, replicas, you tend to get lower latency, but if you employ erasure coding, you get higher latency. If you do um, uh, replication across um, regions, like um, Rafaela was discussing, you, you could get higher latency, but you could also have eventual consistency in some of those, in some of those scenarios to, to improve latency. But, We've seen, we've seen, um, I've, I've, we've certainly seen uh, environments doing extremely low latency. You know, much lower than sub millisecond for, um, for, for database transactions, and, and it is definitely possible to achieve uh, extremely low latency in in Kubernetes environments. And we're we're seeing um, both in cloud uh, environments and then on prem. You know, the availability of, of NVMe disks, for example, that that support hundreds of thousands of IOPS and um, 10, 40, and 100 gig connections on, on, on cloud instances, which, is, which, is, um, which, can, which can help with, with all of those situations. I don't know if you have. Yeah. Um, no, it's not on. Yeah, I think there was a, an edge, edge component in the question, right? Yeah, I, we, we don't explicitly talk about edge um, in this. I don't think we have, we have analyzed that scenario much, but I, I think, and I'm not an expert, but the little I've, that I've done for edge deployments, I think you are willing in those cases to sacrifice, um, you know, latency, I mean, consistency for latency. So I have, I have a quick re local response, and then when the network is available, you, you synchronize with, with the central, you know, uh, data center. Um, 
yeah, you have to pick the right you know middleware for that kind of, uh, of workload. Hi. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, in your table of comparison between uh, traditional deployment and Kubernetes deployment, it's, there is some kind of mismatching between HA and DR. For example, in traditional deployment, if I de uh, want to provide HA, I deploy several instances on the same data center or on different data centers and provide uh, east-west communication between them. It can be active-active, active-passive, so it's very close to your example in Kubernetes. On the same hand, uh, in Kubernetes, maybe we need to provide some backup as well. Okay, we deploy on different data centers, but uh, backup and restore we will require two, maybe. <laughs> so, I, I don't understand. Uh, maybe. Go ahead. yeah. So, you're you're absolutely right. And w when we were putting that table together, we had quite a lot of debate as to what each of the terms should mean. Um, and, you know, what we what we decided on was it's impossible to count all of the different possible scenarios and all of the different edge cases. So we decided to, to put together something that kind of represented the, the most informed, I guess, scenario and, and the most common scenarios that, that, that we were coming around with. In, in the actual document itself, we then cover a lot more details as to the, the, the variations of those scenarios. Thank you very much.